Now we're going to talk about the mean value theorem and the in Rawls theorem. We talked about how if you had two points and the two y values were at the same level, that somewhere in between those two two points at least once, there is some value c where the slope is zero and there was brief references made to, you know, that would be like where you'd have a maximum or minimum. We talked about a velocity going to zero. So there were a few aspects of that in the last video. In this video, though, we're going to explore what happens if you if you don't necessarily want zero. What if you want something else? What if you want a tangent line that's parallel to two points that are not at the same height necessarily, right? So what they have is the mean value theorem. I'm going to show you kind of what it looks like in just a minute. So the mean value theorem says let f be a function that satisfies the following hypotheses. It starts off like Rawls. f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b. f is differentiable on the open interval from a to b. Then there is at least one number c within that interval such that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now, I don't know if that looks familiar to you, but what it's saying is let's say that we have some sort of a curve. And this is a and this is b, and they are not at the same height. I could find a straight line slope between a and b. And that what this says is that there is some point on the curve, you can kind of eyeball it and see that on the curve there's a point here where the slope of the tangent is parallel to the slope of the secant. So this is the secant line between A and B, and this is the tangent. So this part on the right, if you remember from college algebra days, you had y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's what this says. So this is, <coughs> excuse me, x1, x2. This f of x1 is actually the y that goes with that. And this is x2, and this is f of x2. So this is the difference over the y's over the difference in the x's. So this is the college algebra version of the slope, which is actually an average slope. OK, this is the calculus version, because remember the derivative gives you the equation for the slope anywhere along the curve. So this is the calculus version of the slope. You would obtain the value from the slope function, and this is instantaneous. So what it's saying, it's really kind of neat if you think about it, is that you can have an average slope between A and B. And then you can find an instantaneous slope on the curve that's equal. OK, I mean, it's actually kind of interesting. So let's look at uh, an equation and try this out. And so if we have f of x is equal to x squared minus 3x minus 10, and I want to talk about the interval between minus 2 and 4, then what we're trying to find out is if there's if f of prime of c, if we can find c, that would make this f of b minus f of a over b minus a, <coughs> where this is a and this is b. All right? So I'm actually going to divide my paper sort of in half right here. So on the right side, let's think algebra, right? So I need to find f of 4. So f of 4 is 4 squared minus 3 times 4 minus 10. So this turns out to be negative 6. 
and f of negative 2 is negative 2 squared minus 3 times negative 2 minus 10. This turns out to be 0. So what I have is the point for negative 6 and negative 2, 0. Right? So calculating the slope on this side, which is the average slope, right? I would say it is, if this is A and this is, I'm sorry, that was backwards. This is A and this is B. All right, so we're going to start with B. And we would have minus 6 minus 0 over 4 minus a minus 2. So this turns out to be minus 6 over 6, which is negative 1. All right. And on this side, we're going to calculate the derivative. So f prime of x is actually 2x minus 3. So what we have is that the derivative, this f prime of x equal to 2x minus 3, has to be equal to this slope. Because remember, this is the instantaneous slope. OK? And this is the average. So what I want to find out is where is 2x minus 3 equal to negative 1? And this would be. 2x is 2, x is 1. So this is my value c, right? Now, so if they ask you for c, you have to tell them it's c. If they ask you for x, then you tell them it's x. Now, what I want to show you is I want to talk about the tangent line. So I'm going to actually go ahead and calculate up the tangent line. So to do that, the equation for it, I need to come up with an ordered pair at this value, x is 1. OK, so at x is 1, y is equal to 1 squared minus 3 times 1 minus 10, because you have to put it back into the original function, right? Because I want a point on the line. So y turns out to be negative 12. So the point is 1, negative 12. Then we're going to use the um, point slope for the line. So you'd go y minus a minus 12 is equal to minus 1 times x minus 1. Because you have y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, right? Hope you've memorized that by now. Hopefully your calculus teacher has been drilling that one in. So when you clean this up, you get minus x minus 11. And this is the equation of the tangent. Okay. So this is the tangent. I also went off and figured out what the secant was. So this is secant. I used the point negative 2, 0. And its slope is also negative 1. So its equation of the line is minus x minus 2. OK. And if you'll look, this slope is minus 1 and this slope is minus 1. So I can already tell that they're parallel. But I wanted to graph it for you. So using Desmos, the red is the parabola, which was our original function right here. And then this is the secant between these two points of negative 2 and 4. And this is the tangent. Right here, that's parallel. Okay, think you got that? All right, let's do another one. Just make sure my graph is right over there. Yep. All right. So let's think about y is equal to one over x, and I want to look at the area between two and four. Now, if you remember from algebra when you learned your parent functions or library functions, 1 over x looks kind of like this. Right? And I'm looking, you know, between 2 and 4. 
Okay, so what I have to do is I have f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a, and I'm sure you'll have to memorize that. All right, this being a and this is b. So one way is to write it down a bunch of times. Another way is to say it to yourself a bunch of times. I tend to do both. All right, and I also tend to divide my work into two halves so I can kind of see what I'm doing. So I want to have f of 4, which is 1 over 4. And I want f of 2, which is 1 over 2. So the slope that I would get from using algebra would be 1 fourth minus 1 half over 4 minus 2. And what I can do, now you can group the fractions together and get a fraction over a number and then clean it up. I'm doing it the way I showed you in an earlier video on cleaning up complex fractions. So I'm multiplying by the least common denominator. So it's faster and less likely to have errors. And this turns out to be 1 minus 2 over 16 minus 8. So this is negative 1 over 8. And the derivative, right, so if this is f, then actually f of x is x to the minus 1 because I don't want to do the quotient rule. You can do the quotient rule. I just don't want to. All right, so you bring the minus 1 down, you leave the x alone, you take 1 off the power. So that's the derivative. And these two things have to be equal. So you would have the negative of 1 over x squared is equal to the negative of 1 eighth. And since the two negatives are equal and the two numerators are equal, then the two denominators have to be equal. And so x turns out to be plus or minus the square root of 8, which is plus or minus 2 square roots of 2. Now our original interval was 2 to 4. So I'm not sure exactly where 2 square roots of 2 falls because, you know, I need to estimate it. So 2 square roots of 2 turns out, out actually to be 2.83. So I was sure that the negative 2 square roots of 2 wasn't going to be in my interval because 2 and to 4 are positive. But the positive 2 square roots of 2, which is 2.83, is in my interval. So that's the one I'm going to use. And that's my c value. Now, if you if you want to, you can go ahead and calculate up the tangent in the secant line, right? So if this is c, then you have to come up, or x, whichever way you want to look at it, you have to come up with a value for y to do your tangent, and then we'll talk about the secant. So if x is 2 square roots of 2, y is 1 over x. So it's 1 over 2 square roots of 2, which by the time you multiply top and bottom by the square root of 2, turns out to be square root of 2 over 4. So your point is 2 square roots of 2, square root of 2 over 4. And we're going to run that in the point slope formula. So you'd go y minus square root of 2 over 4 is equal to minus 1 eighth x minus 2 square roots of 2. Remember, it's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So y equals minus 1 eighth x plus square root of 2 over 4, plus another square root of 2 over 4. So this turns out to be minus 1 eighth x plus the square root of 2 over 2. So this is my tangent. You can go back and calculate up the equation of the secant. The equation of the secant turns out to be y minus 1 half is equal to negative 1 eighth x minus 2, and it turns out to be negative 1 eighth x plus 3 fourths. So to show you what that looks like, it's kind of hard to see. So the red one is the 1 over x, and then you have your blue one, which is the one that's connecting the yeah, 
that's the secret. I had to make sure I had to look at my notes because it looks so tight I wasn't sure. So the secant is the blue one and the tangent is the green one. I thought I didn't want to write that down and then take it back. Okay, so you can see how these are really close. Then one more problem. All right, so there's kind of an interesting thing that some books and some teachers ask. So we're going to talk about it. And it says if f1 is equal to 10 and the f prime of x is greater than or equal to 2 on the interval from 1 to 4, how small can f of 4 be? And the reason I wanted to talk about this is, is because let's just pretend for a second that this shows up on your test. And in calculus class, if you haven't experienced this before, it's fair game, okay, for the teacher to ask you something you has, haven't actually seen. It's not unfair. So this, if you're taking calculus, they're assuming that you're going into some sort of a field that either uses calculus on a fairly regular basis or you're going into a field where you sort of have to conquer new um, situations with just the knowledge that you have. And so you have to be able to take two pieces of information you're comfortable with and deal with a situation you're not comfortable with, right? Doctors do it all the time, um, engineers, um, pharmacists. I think they have to take calculus now. There's a lot of people that, that calculus just says, okay, now we've taught you some details. Can you put them together in a new way? Okay, so let's say we're taking a test and we're looking at this problem and I don't know if you're going to fuss about it in your mind or anything. You know, when you look at it and go, you know, we didn't do anything like that. Okay, fair. Keep it to like 10 seconds and then let's move on because blank is definitely wrong. And so what we're going to do is say, well, hey, I'm going to I'm going to try something. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe I'll get a couple of points, partial credit, I don't know, all right? So you look at it and go, okay, I've got a point, right? I've got the point 110, and I've got a slope, right? It's the instantaneous one. And I've got an interval that, that this one is the one from the 110. And this four is actually four something. Okay, I don't know what that something is. And that's what they're asking, is how small can that something be? So do you see how you have kind of two points and a slope? And you're thinking, wait a minute, this is the instantaneous slope. And from these two points, um, from this point and this point, I could kind of set up like I'm going to solve this. Let's see if this works. Okay. So remember we had F prime of X or C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Right. So let's assume that I can at least get some credit for writing the formula down. Sometimes it's just like that y'all. Okay. Sometimes you just have to try something. You know, staring at it isn't going to get you anywhere. So let's see what we can fill it in, right? So um, f of b would be whatever f of 4 turns out to be. f of a is my 10, right? So that would make this 4 and this minus 1. And this would be my f prime of x or f prime of c or whatever you want to call it, right? So let's try what we can. Okay, so... Um, this would be f of 4 minus 10 over 3. Okay, I could multiply both sides by 3. Let's say I, I still don't know what exactly I'm doing, but hey, I'm filling in space. And to me, every time I fill in space, it's like, okay, maybe my teacher will give me uh, another point or two. All right, and my goal is to find f of 4, right? So I can say, all right, here's f of 4. And this is 3f prime of x. I can move the 10 over, right? And then you look at it and go, well, I really can't, I don't think, clean it up much more, right? I mean, I've kind of moved everything around. I've got what they're asking me to solve for by itself. Um, oh, well, they did tell me from the given that f prime of x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So the slope between those two points is at least... Two could be steeper, 
Okay, but it's at least two. So what if it is two? If it's at least two, that means the slope isn't any less than two. It could be bigger than two. And if I'm using my smallest slope, then that should give me my smallest next y value, right? My, my smallest rise, okay? So let's try that. So let's start with two, that would be my smallest. So I'd have three times two plus 10, right? And so this is now going to be less than or equal to because f of four could be, remember you can read these things backwards, so f of 4 is greater than or equal to whatever this is. Remember, this is my y at x is equal to 4. So it's going to be greater than or equal to whatever this is. This is my smallest number, right? So f of 4 is greater than or equal to, and that'd be 16, right? If you're not used to reading backwards, you know, when you read right to left, you start with, f of 4, and if you hit the wider side of the inequality first, you say greater than. If you hit the point first, you say less than. If, you, if you're still working on the thing that you learned in high school or junior high where they talk about the little alligator eating the bigger number, um, that works as long as you're reading left to right, <laughs> okay, but it, or it points at the smaller number. Um, I would be careful about that, so just learn that if you hit the wider side of the inequality first, you say greater than. If you hit the pointy side, you say less than. So if f of 4 is greater than or equal to 16, I can reverse it to where it looks better. It still has to point at the same 16 like it did before. Then the smallest value, if it's 16 or bigger, is 16. And that's the answer to the question. So that's kind of interesting, but the main thing I wanted to show you out of this last problem is if you see something and encounter it in homework, on a test, in a discussion, it, it, is, it is not to your benefit just to leave it blank. It's not to your benefit to fuss about it too much and say, if you didn't do anything like this, get busy, okay? Put something down, see, write down whatever it is that you think you can vaguely find appropriate and maybe it'll hit you. It's sort of like proofs in trig where you have to get to like the second or third line before you're finished, before you're sure you're in the right direction. And somewhere right around in this area is when I went, hey, this might actually be helpful, okay? So all the part that was up here, you're not real sure that you're heading in the right direction. You just sort of have to be willing to take a chance, say, well, at least this information that's given to me up here would fit into that category, and maybe it will occur to me what to do, okay? So, all right, well, that takes care of this video. Don't forget to like or subscribe the video. Uh, the links are in the description for the next video and for the practice problems. And I will see you at the next video.